Hey everybody, David Burns with you again for a live stream tonight on a Thursday night. Thanks for joining me. Good to have you along. I appreciate Sherry helping us in the control room, land the spaceship and all that good stuff. So, and Christian is helping us as well, keep everything running. So thanks guys. Tonight we have a great time together. We have a lot of things to talk about, looking forward to it. So it's been a great week. Um, for me, I've been out in the bee yards a lot, doing a lot of work with the bees, staying busy. And uh, boy, today it got up to 81 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was almost hot. I don't know what happened to spring. We went right, I mean, I don't know what happened to spring. We went right from winter into summer. We had about a day and a half of spring, <laughs> and then it was over with. But it's been a lot of fun. So I want to thank you guys for dropping in. I know uh, it's good to see some familiar names out there today. Thank you so much. I'm going to be talking about bee lining. And if you've never heard about that, it is a way to get free bees. And I want to talk to you about that to start off our live uh, stream today. Oh, here it is over here. And look at this uh, little thing here. This is a bee lining um, device. And if you've never seen one of these, they're really cool. I want to explain it to you. But first, let me show you. Look look at this letter. I'm going to hold it up here so I can read it. To David Burns, I met you and Sherry briefly at Hive Life this year. So I wanted to send something for your YouTube background. The bee hunting box is explained by Tom Seeley in a paper he wrote back in the 80s called Bee Lining. I enjoy your book, Backyard Beekeeping, by you and Sherry. This is my third year uh, third spring and beekeeping. I plan on raising queens this spring. Thanks for a great teaching about it this winter. And on the back, it says, um, I always watch all your videos. I hope this fits your background. Yeah. So I have a background in my other, I've got like several places where I make uh, videos and the indoor studio is in a different building from where I'm at now, but I've got a couple of studios there with some background beekeeping equipment. You've seen videos from there. So uh, Joe, thanks so much. He sent me this and it looks like he made this. And so I wanna explain it to you. So this is a way using this box. It's a very old traditional method where you can actually do some bee lining and why it's called bee lining is it's because it's a way for you to capture bees and then watch which direction they go. Like if you see, if you're out in a big field and you don't have any hives near you, but you're wanting to find out what tree some bees are in, or maybe, you know, maybe they're in a, an old car or an old shed or something. And you want to, you want to go get them because you want free bees. You can use this box, this bee lining box to do it. So let me show you if I can get it in front of us here. Um, so it has two openings on it. This opening has a piece of plexiglass on it. And it has a middle section, a middle piece that goes up and down. This is, I think this is called the front. And as you look down, this piece can go up and down. I was going to bring a piece of comb in and forgot, but so what you do is you take this out to a bee yard where you see bees. Maybe you've got maybe even dandelions or something. Again, it's not to be used in an apiary. You're wasting your time. You got to go somewhere where you're trying to find bees naturally, feral wild bees in a hive somewhere or a tree somewhere, not in a hive. And you go out there and you get a chair and what you do, you actually can go and capture bees. Now, uh, Joe mentioned that Tom Seeley has uh, written a book on this, and I'm going to give you a link to that book. It's in the description of this video, by the way. It's a nice book to read. But Tom Seeley has presented this uh, at many conferences. He has a talk that he gives, and he shows how he's using this box in bee lining. I have been present for a couple of his presentations on using this box and how he loves to do it. This is not really something that you're going to take up and say, I'm going to start beekeeping and I want to get 50 hives and I'm going to use this box to get 50 hives. I mean, you could do it, but this is more of something as a hobby. It's fun. It's sort of like bird watching because sometimes you may want to use this just for fun with the family and you may not even capture the bees when you find them. It's just a way of finding out where they're located. 
it's sort of like geocaching. I used to be a geocacher and that is sort of like geocaching only uh, you're trying to locate where the bees are. So the way Tom has done this uh, and explained it is uh, he will go out with this box and maybe he'll see a bee on a flower and he'll just go up to the flower and snap it closed, you know, get the bee in there, the flower in there. And then you can look in the back and see if you've got the bee and you're like, okay, I got the honey bee. I see it in there, right? Cause the door can't get out now. And maybe you'll capture two or three bees um, and you'll see three or four bees in there. It's a way to do it. But usually you take a piece of comb off one of your, you know, piece of comb you have laying around the apiary somewhere and you put some sugar water in that piece of comb and then you set the piece of comb inside here and you wait until bees are captured in there. I think the, let me see if I figure this out. Okay, here's how you do it. Now I got it. So once you have some bees here, like three or four, six bees in the window, this would be open like that. I guess if you hold it up to the sun, the bees are going to be right up here. Close the door. Okay, now you got your bees in this section. You can see them. Now you can open this side and take the little comb I talked about. Bees like to know they're robbing um, honey out of a comb. So if you've got a piece of comb that's empty or maybe even has honey in it, but you can put the comb in here and then you close the door and then you open the middle section, about that high, and the bees will go on. Whoop, don't let that open up but you'll have to keep it closed. That's what the rubber bands are for. But once the bees go in here, they'll get on the, the comb with the honey in it or the sugar water. And then after five minutes or so, um, what you wanna do is release them. So you release them and you'll see them fly out and they're excited. They'll take an orientation flight to figure out where to come back and get more. And they'll fly off and tell their sisters you know, where this nectar is, sugar water. And more bees will come back. Now, what you can do is actually start timing how long it takes these bees. Um, if you're like me, and even Tom recommends this, it's fun to mark your bees. If you have a queen marking pen, then when they're sitting there on the piece of comb, and you can even lay it out a little bit, but while they're there, you can just touch the back of them with the you know, yellow, green color, marking pen for a queen. And then you can watch how long it takes them to come back. And that's pretty critical. I don't have my notes in front of me and I don't have, uh, I don't remember. But if it takes, you know, a certain amount of time, um, then it means that they're close by. So I think if, it, if they're gone and they come back in five minutes, that means they're within a half a mile, something like that. It takes longer, they could be uh, further away. I think a quarter mile, they're gone about five minutes until they return. Now, one of the ways that you can track the tree down using this is that once you have bees that are coming to this, what you do is you keep moving this. You don't have to capture them anymore because you've kind of got them trained to come back to here. But you watch which direction they fly off. Like, let's say, you, you know, you've got good eyes and you can see they go that way. Shoom. Well, then you move this further down the bee line. Bees usually fly in a straight line back home. And so you keep moving this down the bee line until they come back, they see it, and you just, you just kind of walk it back a little bit at a time. You move it. You can set it on a table. You have a chair. It takes a lot of patience. This is for fun. And so you just keep taking this closer and closer to where this beehive is in a tree. Now, again, you, you want to go with the bees that are coming back fast. So if a bee is gone, a green bee goes away, and two minutes later she comes back, that's the one you want to follow. Otherwise, you could be walking three miles <laughs> trying to find the beehive, the bee, the bee tree. But anyway, you can just use this and track down where those bees are. Sometimes they're in a, a hollow tree. Sometimes you might find them in an old house or a barn or something. But I wanted to present this to you guys, and I appreciate Joe for making this for me. And I will put it in my studio, but Joe, I'm going to use it too. I'm going to make a video where we go out there. I'll, I'll have to go somewhere away from where my bees are. They're just, I'm just going to go back to my old hives. But I'll find a place way out in the middle of nowhere where we can start looking for bees. But this is a bee lining box, 
and it's a lot of fun to play with. If, you, if that's something in beekeeping that you've never done, then I think you would really enjoy it. Um, the book is that Tom Seeley wrote. Tom Seeley wrote The Democracy of Honeybees, the recent book that so many of you enjoy. Well, this book he wrote probably several years ago is called Following the Wild Bees. And there's an Amazon affiliate link if you want to go there and purchase that book and learn more about bee lining. And if you are trying to find some free bees, that's the way to do it. Um, it's probably going to be difficult because you're going to trace these bees all the way back to a tree. And they may be up, you know, 60 feet in the top of a an old rotted tree that got hit by lightning or something that, so, you know, don't risk life and limb to get a, a bunch of bees that only cost a hundred bucks. You know, it's not worth a broken leg or getting hurt trying to do that. Um, but I thought that would be uh, an interesting thing. I could tell you guys about bee lining. If you've never heard that, it's a lot of fun. And, and Tom does make this presentation a lot. At a, at a lot of the conferences about bee lining. And you can watch other YouTube videos. Uh, just do a search for bee lining Tom Seeley, and you can watch how he does it. And you can gain a little more experience in doing it yourself and have a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, oh, let's see, I was going to say something about, I don't know, I'm interested to know if Joe actually, it says he has a website Joe Woodworking in the Apiary, but I, I wonder if he's on the chat tonight. I'm not sure, but I, I'd like to know whether Joe makes these where people can buy them. Um, I, I'm not sure, but that would be interesting if he he was on there. He could tell us if he wanted to, to make a, that information known or not. But uh, let me know in the comments, guys, if you've ever done any bee lining. I'd be interested, interested to know if you've ever done any of, of your own bee lining before and tracing down some bees find out uh, where they're going. But it's a fun thing to do because um, especially in seasons like the fall where bees are desperate, then you can certainly start looking carefully, uh, more carefully because bees are starving. Thank you, Austin Payne, for that super sticker. Austin Payne for $10. I appreciate that, Austin. Hey, guys, I want to tell you that I've been making uh, some videos. I posted a video just a few hours ago, and it is, it's doing really well on YouTube. So many people are watching it. Um, let me see. I think I can show it a little bit. Um, do I have that here? Let me look. Mm, oh, yeah, I do. Here it is right here. Um, it says, Finding the Queen in a Hot Hive. And I just made that video. So after we're done with the live stream, you got to check this video out. This video is really interesting when I when I made when I was doing the filming of this video actually. Um, so so many things happen that you don't really plan on. Well, one of the things that happened, this is a very hot hive. Very it's my most aggressive hive on the whole on the whole apiary. I know you're not supposed to say aggressive, they're defensive. You don't want to use the A word, but these bees are very defensive. And I just I kept thinking, I need to make a video, but I want to make it about. I want to make it about something else because I don't want to open that hot hive up. But anyway, this hive swarms. I've had it for several years. It swarms, and I wanted to get ahead before it swarmed. And sure enough, I found queen cells in it. Oh, I don't want to tell you the, 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 the storyline. But anyway, one of the things I, I was able to show in this video is a neat trick in case you're having trouble finding your queen. Like in this hive, I had to take the queen to make a split. So I had to find her. And in the season of uh, coming out of winter into early spring, bees aren't in a normal, usually a normal configuration here in Illinois early in the spring. Because what I mean is, you know, when the when the bees are running a hive in the summer, there's honey on top, there's brood on certain areas. But man, in the wintertime, the way I feed bees, there's brood everywhere. And you'll see that in this video. This particular hive, I gave them one quart of sugar water to see if I could prompt them a month ago to raise brood, about a little over a month ago, and it did. You'll be shocked at the amount of brood that that quart of sugar water with my additives actually caused that hive to raise. It's incredible. So I did a video a few weeks ago of another hive I made a split from that I did not feed a quart jar back a month and a half ago, and they had minimal brood. So again, I'm validating my premise that boy, if you can feed bees 42 days before your first 
anything blooms, then you'll have a foraging force and a big amount of brood ready when dandelions pop. It's, it's just so easy to do. A lot of people get confused about the mathematics of bees, but bees are very mathematical. You know, it's math. It really is. Uh, bees emerge on day 21. And so you just kind of do the math. They become foragers uh, 23 days after that. And so you just start doing the math and you get these numbers and you start thinking about when does flowers start blooming in your area. And then if you prompt and stimulate the bees to raise brood 42 days prior to a nectar flow, you'll have a huge workforce ready to fill up your honey supers. If you don't do that, then what happens is the first foraging force, the bees are going to, or the first foraging opportunity, the bees are just going to go gather the nectar and consume it and use it for brood building. And they're going to use it to build up their hive. So if you can start with a strong colony, a lot of resources already on board, then they're going to take the nectar that they go to in a, with a big army of foragers and put it right into your honey supers. So fun. So fun to see that kind of math working out, I think. So anyway, check that video out today. Uh, appreciate it if you take a look at that. Watching my videos, I really appreciate you guys checking my videos out. Always give me a thumbs up. Go ahead and do it right now. Give me a thumbs up. It helps a lot. And subscribe. We always like to have subscribers. Uh, Mad Mike's Garage says, uh, a package put in last Friday. I noticed pollen coming in to the hive two days ago. Is it safe to assume the queen is out of the cage and laying? Uh, last Friday, boy, she'd have to be out. It'd be odd if she wasn't out already. Bees can still bring in pollen without the queen walking around, so there's no guarantee. But yeah, I would say 90% chance your queen is out walking around Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You're six days out, so maybe in another day you're going to take a look and say, yep, there she is. Thanks, Chris, for the super sticker of 1999. I appreciate that so much. Um, all of the donations you guys make, uh, they really do help the channel so much. To be honest with you, um, beekeeping uh, with a content uh, create, creator taking cameras out there like I do and all, I am so hard on equipment. It is just not fun tearing stuff up. I've broken two tripods now. I broke the camera port for my microphone, got that fixed. Really appreciate the donations to keep my channel running, to keep my equipment functioning. Hello, David. Love your videos. I took the queen and five frames from my hive on the 8th. It had two swarm cells charge for action. When would you when would you do your next inspection on that hive? Think on the 29th. You know what? Uh, let's see. You took the queen in five frames. So that means the queen. Oh, you're, you're talking about and it had two swarm cells and charge for action. I don't know if that means capped over or if they're just got larvae in there. Um, but generally we go by the egg. Once the egg is laid, you're going to have a laying queen in 30 days. So if you're ahead of the game, if this, if the, if that cell is capped over, you can take off eight days because that's probably when they capped it over. So from 30 days, you're down to 22 days in the future when you can look. So yeah, you know, 29th may not be a bad idea to take a look. Micah, thank you. Wow, Micah. Stafford, $50. I really appreciate that tremendously. Really do. $50. Very kind of you to make that donation for sure. You know, as uh, content creators, we're always trying to figure out a way like I'm using my laptop to record this uh, live stream. And I thought I need to buy a camera because I like this monitor here better than my laptop monitor. I'm going to put a camera over there. So maybe that'll help me buy that camera that I can put on top of that monitor over here. Don't have to be looking back and forth so much. So thank you. I appreciate it. Fifty dollars. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, we're th talking about the timing of uh, when to expect to go back in. It just depends on mating, too. How soon will they mate and where you can start seeing eggs? And that's a big thing, too. You want to be able to wait long enough where you don't have to look for the first egg laid because you got too many frames to find that one egg, right? You wait another week or 10 days, you'll see larvae all over the place. It's easier to see larvae than eggs. Should I throw out comb that 
that served as a mice nest over the winter? Let me tell you about that. Good question, Kevin. One year I had a bunch of mice get into a hive over winter and they ate some of the frames and even ate the plastic. They just nibbled away at the plastic foundation. It was terrible. I think they killed the hive even. But anyway, that those frames smelt so bad, like, like mice urine. It smelt so bad. I could not get the bees to get back on those frames again. They wouldn't do it. I even kind of scraped it off, re-waxed them. They still smelt bad. I gave up. I was like, okay, I learned my lesson that bees are kind of finicky uh, about things like this when they have a bad odor. If you stop and think about it, honeybees operate, communicate by pheromones. Those are smells. And they mix these pheromones together to communicate different things. And if you have an overpowering smell, then it's difficult for them to communicate because they don't smell things very well. That's why we smoke bees or like if you get stung on the arm, you know, you, you usually want to pull the stinger out and smoke your arm to mask the alarm pheromone that is around the stinger that will kind of be a target. So these, these smells that you're smelling in the hive are pheromone communication. So mice that have made it smell bad, you know, it's not worth it. You can try it like I did if you want to. I'm thinking it's not going to be very good to reuse old frames. Hey, Eric, good to see you again. Installing a new package on Saturday on new equipment, forecast storms and a cold snap. Of course. Hey, what? <laughs> that's what happens. You know, you have all this beautiful weather. Your bees arrive. It's a thunderstorm, cold weather. I, I get it. Plan to feed your supplements, one-to-one -one, uh, syrup. Follow, follow your package video, but worried about a cold snap. Your thoughts on a cold snap. Well, you know, I once lost about 20 packages from a cold snap. It just dipped down into the 20s, but... I think I lost all the queens and about half of my packages that I got that year, it was a long time ago, but I had about 40 packages, 20 of them perished all because of a cold snap. So it is risky because you're putting them on, I think you said foundation, meaning undrawn foundation. Bees typically push their heads into comb to stay warm and radiate the heat from one frame to the next. So established colonies do really well keeping warm because they have food to consume to make heat. They have drawn comb to push themselves into to make a tighter cluster through the combs. But when they're on foundation, the foundation just kind of gets in the way and doesn't allow them to do that as well. So what should you do? You know, I don't know what cold is to you. If it's dipping down to above freezing, you know, it's probably not going to be that risky. But if it's getting into the below freezing and in the 20s, do everything you can, like throw a blanket on it. Here's a trick. If it's getting really cold, close it off. You know, after the bees go back in or something, close it completely off. You can use one eighth inch hardware cloth and put it on the opening of the hive to shut it off. And you probably got them in a single deep, so they're real lightweight to pick up. Pick them up, put them in your garage. <laughs> Don't let them out. Just let them in your garage. They're going to be out. They're going to be in their hive anyway when it's cold, clustered. Let them cluster in a warmer place, sheltered. And then when it warms up the next morning, you know, gets above freezing or 40 or whatever, walk it back out there and put it back out in the yard somewhere. That's that's kind of what I would suggest. Just don't let them sit out there and be real cold. Now, this is a very good time to say one of the pet peeves that Sherry has that you can push her button is when you tell her that you got your package too early and it's in the middle, first or middle of March, and you're worried that your bees aren't going to make it because it's too cold. <laughs> Sherry and I both feel very strongly that you need to get your bees, depending on where you live, you know, we're all over the place here, but in Illinois, boy, I would never recommend packages before the middle of April. That was an old Walter T. Kelly um, idea. He, he always said, Illinois, uh, no sooner than April the 15th is when you should get your packages. You can get by with it because, you know, weather can be nice. You can also get bit in the butt by it, by like these cold snaps that are happening. So it can be, can be very challenging as well. Got to get me a little drink of water here. 
but I know a lot of you are starting to install packages. That's really good. Hello, Luke. Good to see you. Talk about identifying different queen cells. How can you tell a supersedure cell from a swarm cell? And I know cells are typically on the bottom, but other than that, I don't know. Yeah, Luke, that's a good question. Now, we can always say that traditionally and historically, we've always said that supersedure cells, that means they're replacing their queen because she's failing. Something happened to her, so they have to raise a new one. Those are on the middle to the upper part of a frame. Swarm cells, historically, we always say they're on the very bottom side, lower part of the frame from the middle down. Generally, in my experience, supersedure cells are like one of them, just one or maybe two at the most. Swarm cells are like 12, and it could be five on this frame, five on another frame, 10 on the next frame. So you'll see the number can be a determining factor. They're not going to supersede the queen with 20 cells. That's That would be rare. And uh, they're not going to swarm with one queen. <laughs> that's, that's not, they're, they're raising a lot of queen for insurance purposes. So they need to swarm. They're going to make a lot of queens. Now, whether they're on the top section or the lower section is not always the case. That's the troubling part. Sometimes they will put swarm cells wherever there's a kind of like an uneven space or a break or a crack or a funny bump out on the comb. So swarm cells, I've seen them as, I've seen them in this supersedure area, middle of the frame, higher up sometimes. Uh, the ones that I saw in the video that I just recommend you watch that I posted today, they were all within three inches of the bottom of the, of the frame. So there's, you can't really tell much by the visual, uh, what the cell itself looks like. Um, you can't really tell that, but you can tell by the number and the location. And other than that, you're going to have to hope that what you're seeing is indeed, but use, use other data. Like don't just, don't just use the appearance of the cell, right? You're going to have to use other data. Like, is it a huge colony that needs to swarm? Did I lose my queen a long time ago and now I see a supersedure cell? You know, if you see a whole bunch of swarm cells and you see the queen walking around, then you pretty much know, uh-oh, you know, there she is. So they're not trying to replace her. There's a lot of eggs and brood looks good, but I have a lot of queen cells. That's, that's swarm. You look in the hive, you see poor brood pattern, you see little brood, and you see one or two cells halfway up. You know, yeah, they need to replace her and that's what they're doing. So that's a really good question I like that. Hey, Brian, how are you? I see a lot of guys getting into Russian honeybees in the north. What do you think about Russians? Greetings from Wisconsin. Um, you know, your, your question sounds like that's something new, and that's not something new at all. <laughs> maybe new to you, maybe new to people in Wisconsin, but Russian bees have been around for a long time. I must have tried Russian bees, gosh, 10 years ago, Russian queens. So they've been around a long time. My understanding on this, and I want to be careful, I have some friends that are in Russian bees pretty heavily, and we we pretty much hear people say that Russian bees have had more experience with, longer experience with the varroa destructor mite, and so they're a little more resistant to mites. And uh, But on the other hand, when I've tried to run Russian bees, they swarmed a little more, a lot more, and they were a lot more defensive. Now, I'm not sure there are people that are wiser than me on all of this genetic information, but there is an organization. This organization really does monitor the genetics of their Russian queens, and I forget the name of it. But there are other people that sell Russian bees that it doesn't seem to be a part of this bigger organization. So that's it. I, I think the other, the organization has better data. I think they keep better genetic data. I think they give you a pedigree. I mean, they're really good from what I understand. And their bees are, these Russian bees are good. Listen, if you want to find the perfect queen, Russian, Carniolan, Caucasian, Italian, that is going to be best for your mite control, it's not out there. You cannot sacrifice mite testing and mite treatment, mite monitoring. 
you can't give that up just because you think you have a queen that somebody said is mite resistant. There's, we don't have mite resistant queens. That doesn't exist. We have some queens that are better at it. You know, we have some bees that are more hygienic. They're more sensitive about it. They do a better job at controlling it. Yes. And a lot of good people doing that, like Corey Stevens, uh, Dr. John Harbo. I mean, those, those guys are heroes. And there's a lot more that are trying to do this. But again, they will admit they're not at 100%. And then if, you're, if your queen gets superseded, then you lose those genetics. A big part of those genetics are back to, back to day one, scratch one again. So um, Russian bees, uh, be careful who you choose them from and, and make sure you're getting them from a reputable place that has um, some good data to share with you about the history of that Russian queen. Oh my gosh, I hear about clipping queens. Do you think this is still a good pack practice or dangerous? I never, I used to, Early on, when I started raising queens millions of years ago, people back then wanted me to clip the back wing, I think, of the queens. And I had little nail clippers that I would clip the back wing. Now, the idea is that if you do that, that queen can never swarm. That's the theory, because she can't fly away with the swarm. And so it's they think it's a swarm prevention. If you look back in B culture magazine you can read a lot of articles about it from the 1800s of argument going back and forth i read that the other day by the way i'm going to be a, a columnist now for b culture magazine jerry hayes asked me to be a monthly contributor to b culture so i'm looking forward to that and so if you're not a subscriber if you haven't got into the b culture magazine it is one of the leading magazine in our industry, Bee Culture, and then the American Bee Journal with Eugene. Those are two great uh, magazines. So, um, But anyway, Bee Culture had some good discussions about it. And Damari, uh, Mr. Damari, was actually doing a lot of discussion. He was against clipping in the 1800s. I don't like it. I would never do it. Not at all. Uh, I don't do it for two reasons. Number one, I really think it injures the queen. There's a lot of vessels. There's a lot of um, uh, the anatomy of the wing needs to be there. And when you clip it, it's an injury. It can, it can, uh, may, maybe the queen is, will be fine as, as history has shown us, I guess. But on the other hand, it's possible that the bees could look at her as uh, having an issue and they might supersede her. That's a possibility. But here's what happens. If the colony wants to swarm, then all that, takes place, you know, the queen never tells anybody what to do. They actually decide to swarm by the older bees determining that. They actually have to stop feeding the queen as much. They have to warm her up and actually nudge her out of the hive to swarm. They, she doesn't voluntarily do that. So once they push her out with that broken wing, she crashes to the ground in the grass in front of your hive. What do you, what do you got, right? You got the queen can't fly, but they pushed her out and she can't get back in the hive. That's not a good scenario. You go out there one day, you may not even see it. They, they may get eaten by something. If you do see it, you put her back in. But if you don't see it, they're going to swarm again. They're going to raise a queen with all her wings. So to me, there's better swarm control methods than clipping the wings for sure. How can you tell if your bees are Africanized bees? Okay, that's a good question. Now, here's a mistake some people will tell me. They'll say, David, I bought my package in the spring, and they were so nice. I went out there without a smoker, without a hat and a veil for a month. My queen is marked. She, had a, she has a yellow dot on her. I can see her. I guess the yellow was last year, wasn't it? And everything was great. But then, a, then two months later, my bees are so defensive. And in, in the fall, they just eat me up. I think they've become Africanized. And I say, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you still have your same queen? Yellow queen in there? Yep, same queen. Well, you don't become Africanized. You just don't catch, you know, this mean gene. It's in the queen. So if it wasn't in the queen in the beginning, it's not Africanized. It only got defensive because they're larger in number. They went from 10,000 to 50 to 60,000. They have more honey to protect. So they're more defensive. And in the fall, there's less to forage on. More bees are home when you do your inspection. 
So they just eat you up. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the question. How do you know if they're Africanized? Those Russian queens that I bought a while back, uh, 10 years ago or, or longer, my bee inspector was inspecting my uh, colonies. And that Russian, that Russian hive was just nailing his blue jeans to his legs. And I said, are these Africanized? He's like, nope, they're not, but they're hot. I'd get rid of this queen and replace her. <laughs> Um, so, hey, Tom, thank you so much. Love the videos, lessons, coffee time. Thank you, Tom. Always good to hear from you and appreciate your donations a lot. But at Africanized hives, if you think you have one, what's going to happen is they, are, they react very, very fast and in great numbers. Like if you open the lid up, even when you're smoking them, they will form a hurricane and boil out of that hive. They will cover your veil. They will get on your smoker. They will come out in large numbers. The best way that you can tell that they're Africanized is that, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed with bees that they're trying to attack me. I mean, they're, they're wired to drop a horse down by going up their nostrils. But if you start walking away with an Africanized hive, People tell me you have to walk nearly a mile away to finally get a great number of those bees to stop and break off pursuit. With, an, with a typical uh, bees that we have that aren't Africanized, shoot, you walk, you know, what, 10 feet away and most of them quit. You always have that one that will follow you <laughs> forever. But, you know, you walk away 20 yards, you don't have any bees on you anymore. And that's how you can tell they're Africanized. How, how many uh, pursue you at one time, how many, and then how far do they follow you? Those are good indicators of African eyes. So bees can be pretty hot for sure. We are going to uh, give away some coffee mugs. Look at this. We've had these coffee mugs for a while on our website. This is my favorite one right here. I'm going to, we're going to give this away as a free gift. And uh, let me get that gift started here. Uh, here we go. Um, I'll start collecting, let me go over here. I'll start collecting some comments that you'll leave and just uh, comment hashtag cup one. I'm going to give a few of these away. So hashtag cup one. Let me get back where'd you go. Here you are. Okay. Hashtag cup one is the uh, comment to leave to win this cup. It's got my picture on it. Uh, here we go. Oh, you know what to do. Let me get rid of that. So um, hashtag cup one. So there I am making some videos. And you can join me for coffee time with our cup. Look at this. I don't know if it'll come with this or not, but here's a little sticker of me. <laughs> All right. So hashtag cup number one, if you want a coffee mug with my mug on it. And uh, we'll give that away. We'll let the uh, comments keep coming in for a minute here and uh, see if you... Uh, would be the winner of a coffee mug. That's awesome. We've got uh, a, uh, 91 people are trying for the coffee mug here on my YouTube live stream. Thank you guys so much for live streaming with me every Thursday night at 7. Um, so far, I've been keeping up pretty good uh, doing them every Thursday night. So I appreciate all you guys joining me. And Oh, by the way, while we're getting our comments collected, hashtag cup one if you want to try to win the cup tonight. Um I can't answer all the questions you ask on YouTube. It is overwhelming. Not going to happen. I'm one man. I'm a one man show. But here you can ask questions. And so you might see that I just can't answer your questions on the comments of all the videos that I make. But here you can present your questions. So it might be better for you to instead of, I mean, I want you to leave comments. That helps a lot. But if you have a question, ask them on Thursday night. That'd be a great place to ask them over here. Again, I can't get to all the questions here either, but we'll do as many as we can. If you can't win tonight, then here's the web. Uh, here's the, uh, the the link to our website where we have coffee mugs. It's actually my YouTube merch and where you can um, try to just purchase one of these. So this is the one that we're going to give away right now. Let me take a look, see how many people. Okay, we got 116. So are you ready? Let's give you five more seconds to get hashtag cup number one in there. Try to win this cup. Five, four, 
three, two, one. All right, we're drawing for the winner. This is fun. I like this. I always like to win stuff. I never win anything. Luke. Oh, no, it's almost Luke. It's Ronnie Bishop. <laughs> oh, man, it stopped for a minute on Luke, and then it just, it must have stuck on that little thing and went boing. Ronnie, you need to email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com, and we'll get that cup sent right out to you. That is so good. Wow. Very good. Oh. Oh, somebody's calling me. I almost answered. I was trying to not answer the phone and I almost answered it. So good job, Ronnie. Thank you, guys. We're going to do more cup giveaways in the next few minutes, too. And so keep that in mind. Um, I've actually got several cups. Still getting a phone call. Uh, coffee time. Look at this. Coffee first, then beekeeping. I like that. Got my mug on it. Uh, this one said it just got a picture of a bee on it. And then I've got one here that says coffee time <laughs> with my mug on it. So I've been wanting to do a coffee time so bad. I've got some good life philosophical pointers that I want to share with you guys really soon in coffee time. But my bees are keeping me so busy. It's hard to get out there. So that's really good. Um, okay. Um, if you have any other questions, now's a good time to post your questions on here. Let me see if I can help you out in your beekeeping endeavor. Hey, Martin, I've learned so much from you and your videos. I had a read out this year, dead out maybe? And some of the bees are stuck in the comb. Okay, dead out. Uh, will new bees remove them if I leave some of them or should I remove them all? Good question. So, uh, you know, the hive dies in the cluster. Their heads are in the cells. Their butts are sticking out. They were trying to stay warm and eating the last drop of honey on that comb and they die, right? Froze out. Knock out, just tap them and knock out as many as you can. It's impossible to try to pull all those out. Not worth it. If the comb isn't diseased, if it doesn't have American fowl brood, European fowl brood, nosema spores, all that, and it looks healthy, they just died from low population or something. Yeah, give them to a strong colony. Those, those bees know how to clean them up. So knock out as many as you can and then let the bees clean up the rest. That's the way to do it. All right, we're going to have to give away another cup, it looks like. Cup number two. Let's see. Let me get this set up here. All right. That looks different, but it worked. All right. This is all kind of new to me. All right, here we go. Cup number two. Hashtag cup two is a magic word. So we'll start collecting comments if you leave hashtag cup two. And uh, we got that going now. So we'll do that in just a minute. So, yeah, as I was saying, just make sure you knock off as many bees to save as much work as you can. I don't know if Sherry will keep track of this, but this is the first cup was going to be this one with all the pictures around it. And the second cup is going to be this one with coffee first, then beekeeping. Be our second cup. So this is the one you're trying for today. These are actually nice cups. Oh, you know, I, well, that's another that's another video. <laughs> Some of you have been sending me gifts, and I appreciate that. I was going to show one tonight, but it's in the different studio. But I appreciate any gifts that you send me, and we'll open them up and show. So um, cup number two, and your attempt to win this cup, coffee first, then beekeeping. Um, yeah, that's good. I do enjoy coffee every morning, Sherry and I. We started using, we used to be a French press people. We roast our own beans, grind our own beans, and then ha had a French press. But we've been doing pour-over coffee. It's hot. And uh, we've been enjoying pour-over coffee a lot. It's been uh, very good in the mornings, for sure. One of the things that I noticed uh, this week when I was working out in the bee yard is that this last video that I made, there was a, a time when, the bees were so clumped up, I couldn't find the queen. And I didn't have time. They were hot. I didn't really have the time to spread them all out. So I just created on the fly. I took advantage of a technique somebody told me about. And so I removed, I separated the two deeps, and I still didn't find the queen in the bottom deep. So I walked away with the top deep to my picnic table. Because somebody said, I heard people say, I think it was Randy Oliver, but said if you if you take these frames or these this box away from the hive area, the bees become instantly calmer. Oh my gosh, they were so calm. 
they were they just didn't know where they were located. I didn't even have to smoke them anymore. That really worked out really well. You have to watch that video and see it. So if you've got a hot hive, you can do that. But by separating the two boxes, what I did was, okay, here, here's the deal. If you have two deep boxes and you're just going frame by frame by frame to find the queen, right? Let's say you look at a, you pull this frame up and let's say the queen is on the next one down here, right? Well, you leave a gap. So when you put this one back, she doesn't jump onto this frame. But if she's on this frame, she can go down to the bottom deep. So when you lift this up, she's not there. You put it back, she can walk right back onto it. So that doesn't always happen. But when you're having trouble finding your queen, she's running either from frame to frame as you put them back. She's running to a frame you just looked at. Or she's running down and then back up to where you've already looked at. But by doing it this way, I, I walked off with one deep on the picnic table and I left my other deep over there. Now I can really figure out where she is because she's not going to run out of any of these boxes. I can narrow it down. I found her really quickly. So watch that video. That, those are some really good techniques to use. All right, let's give away cup number two here. Uh, I have some frames with wax moth damage. The foundation is plastic. Can I scrape, reuse it? Should I freeze it for a day first? Here's what I would do with wax moss damage. Um, I would scrape it, scrape it down to the plastic. It wouldn't hurt that much to freeze it for a day just to kill any eggs, but uh, scrape it down, re-wax it. Please re-wax it. I mean, melt wax down, buy it on Amazon, get a paint, an old paintbrush, not an old, get a new paintbrush that doesn't have any paint on it, but just wax. I got videos on this, wax Coat it. I know it comes with wax, but by this time it's kind of done. Put a new fresh coat of wax on there. Put it back in the hive. They'll love it. But you got if you don't cover it with new wax, they won't like it very well. Okay, stream yard giveaway. We're gonna draw for cup number two. Are you ready? Here we go. Nope. <laughs> Here we go. Cup number two. I'm going to keep my mouth. Oh, there it is. John. John's the winner. John, you just won this cup right here. Let me get that out of the way. Good job, John. Yep. You won this cup. Nice coffee. You didn't have coffee time with me. We got one more to give away, Sherry. Let's go ahead. Yeah. John, email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com. And uh, let's go ahead and give one more away. Oh, we got to give this one away. I like this one. Look at this. This, is, this one says coffee time. Um, I don't think I'm new to saying coffee time, but I started saying it years ago, like coffee time. And let me set this up for you. Always surprises me when it does that. All right. So we'll call this one cup three. I think that's right. Start collecting the comments. All right. Very good. Hashtag cup three for this mug right here. Very good. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are doing a lot of things out there in your bee yard, staying busy. Hi, David. I bee team six alum here. When you make a split, do you routinely take the split with the queen in, a, in, in it away from the original site? Hey, Nikki. Thanks for being uh, bee team six. Uh, appreciate that. Bee team six is a mentorship program. So I would always want to take the queen with me because I want swarm control. So by, and that's what I did in the video that you need to watch after we're done with the live stream tonight. But the new video I put out a few hours ago, I found the queen. I had no choice. I had to find this queen because I couldn't leave her in there. They're going to swarm. And so that's when I take this, I find the queen and I put four or five frames in a deep, put other comb around it. That's my split. Back home, they don't have a queen. They have queen cells. I, I think there's a high probability they won't swarm because if they decided to swarm, they would have to swarm with a virgin queen. Not impossible. Not that it's never happened. Highly unlikely. They're queenless. They have, I put foundation in there. They're going to draw out. So they have four, I think they have four frames of foundation to draw out and they don't have a queen anymore. So I think I, I really set them back from swarming. Now they still have time to swarm, they will, but you know you have to be careful. All right, so are we? Uh, we're are we giving this one away, Sherry? Is this the next one we're giving away for cup number three now? Okay, she said yes, it is. All right, let's see how many people. Oh wow, 127 people right now. 
have uh, are going for the coffee time mug, 128. So if you'd like to win this, now's your chance. And let's go ahead and draw. Give you five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, shoot. I always forget to put it up there. There we go. A one-man show here, people. Who's going to win? Wow. SWM, SWM. <laughs> You're the winner. Email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com, and you will get coffee time with my mug on your mug. <laughs> my mug on your mug. <laughs> That's good. Oh, wow. Thank you, Kevin, for your $20 donation. You say the Weather is wild. Trying to determine swarming using the Demeray method, it worked. Then so many bees did vertical split with Snell Grove. Wow, you're doing it all. It worked too. Now doubled my colonies. We'll see how it works. Well, congratulations, Kevin. Thanks for the $20. And uh, yeah, I made videos on Snell Grove board. I made videos on Demeray method as well. And uh, wow, that's great. So you deterred swarming. Good for you. That means you have a lot of honey that you need to find buyers for. Cause man, when you do that, the hive makes a lot of honey. That's for sure. That's crazy. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Michael, I see uh, Michael's comments on my YouTube channel a lot. Glad to see you answer, uh, put those questions here for me. Thank you. Uh, do you find queen, do you find that queen is most time in top brood box this time of year? I'm in Darling, South Carolina. So I do know area matters. Um, Boy, I'd say 50-50 for me. I wish I could always, I always hope and wish, you know, she's going to be on the second frame I look at. Yeah, but oftentimes I do have to go down to the bottom deep. But this time of the year, um, yesterday when I did the video, the bee, the queen was in the top box. I missed her on the first pass or she came back up. I don't know. But she was in the top deep. And there was only two deeps on there. I don't remember the other hive uh, that I did a video on recently where she was over there. But anyway, yeah, they're going to be high up because that's where the heat of the colony is in the wintertime. So they go up where the food, the honey is. And if you don't have, um, you're not supposed to have a queen excluder on in the winter. So the, the, the whole colony moves up just like to do a natural habitat of a tree. And, and the queen is up there laying brood. That's right. I usually, some of my hives that go through the winter with the super on and they start laying in the super. So yeah, they're going to be high up. If I catch a wild swarm in a trap, is it okay to move them next to an existing hive on my bee stand only 100 feet away from the trap site? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, that uh, tra The trapped bees that you captured, a wild swarm, they're uh, hopefully going to take an orientation flight in the new area 100 feet away from your other hive. But um, and they won't get confused and go into that hive. Usually they don't. It can happen. But yeah, you'll probably be fine doing that. That sounds like a good distance of doing that. I've never really cared too much about the close proximity of my bees to each other. As you can tell in my videos, it is a hassle because when I'm making videos, sometimes I can't get my tripod set up because there's a beehive in the way. So I'm moving all my hives over to a new apiary on my same property. Number one, we need to get them away from the building. And number two, I need more room to put camera equipment. So I'm making these more spaced out. It will help me be able to put my tripods and set up my camera gear better than getting all, you know, too tight in there. But of course, there is a reality that if your bees are really close together, some people say you could have more drifting and that might create um, mites to be drifting from one hive into another hive. And the greater distance, the less drifting. But we, most of us feel like mites are spread uh, more so by our, your colony robbing out a, a weak colony that's infested with mites and bringing mites back. And we still feel like mites still could fall off or jump off on a flower and wait for the next bee to show up and catch a bus to the, uh, somebody else's hive. We still feel that's a, a possibility, although not as strong as robbing. Okay, uh, Martin has another question. What should I do with frames of honey from my dead out? Here's the thing. Do those frames look good to you? Sometimes bees have dysentery and they defecate on frames of honey. There'll be brown, gooey, tar-looking substance spotted on those honey frames. 
not going to hurt you if you eat that, but you know, you don't want to sell that to a customer, obviously, but the bees, there could be hidden spores of nosema, especially, but there could be spores from the gut that could still be in the feces. And I would be scared of that. I would not want to feed that poop covered frame of honey back to bees. But if it looks good to you, you don't see that, then certainly, yeah, I would do that. Steve, I appreciate your $20 super sticker. Uh, that's great. It uh, really uh, makes me feel uh, humbled that you guys think enough to support my channel, not just by viewing it, by, by, by sending in your hard earned money to support my channel. I, I really want to say thank you so much. I, that means a lot to me. It really does. I appreciate it. Um, you know, people say you can determine uh, where your heart is by how you spend your money and how you schedule your calendar. <laughs> so money uh, and our, our money and our time, it's worth a lot. I don't take that lightly. Mudgy, thank you. $10. Really do appreciate $10, $10 super sticker donation. That's so kind of you guys so much. All right, what time is it getting to be? Got a, got a few more minutes for some last minute questions that you have on our live stream, April the 13th. We've got our big package B day coming up on April the 22nd. And some of you may be buying packages from us. I'll be out there shaking your hand. We're going to be giving things away in the package B line. I'll be out there maybe giving away some books, other things as you pick up your bees from us. So I'll look forward to that on April 22nd. Honeybeesonline.com. If you guys are wondering where you can get a hold of our classes and take some of our online courses, check that out at honeybeesonline.com. Also, you can check out honeybeesonline.com for any of these cups that you saw tonight. There's many of them, and you can have coffee time. I'm going to make a coffee time pretty soon. Guys, get this. Man, Rusty, thank you for the $2.99 super sticker, Rusty. I appreciate that. Nice picture of you there. I can see you. I appreciate it, Rusty. I want to tell you about this flow hive. I got to get busy. I got a lot of parts to put together. Oh, my gosh. This thing looks very complicated. I'm just going to have to wake up early and spend a whole day putting this flow hive together. And so that's going to be fun. But I've, I've got it. I'm looking at it. Can't believe if any, any criticism so far is, wow, does it come unassembled? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm used to putting boxes together and throwing frames in a box. This thing, wow. I got a lot of work to do. It'd be fun, but I can't decide how to paint it. I kind of want to paint it just easy, you know, just paint it a paint and be done with it, paint it a certain color, be done with it. But then I'd like to paint a design on it, make it look beautiful. I thought about wax dipping it, but then I don't really want just for it to look like a wood wax dip. And uh, I need an artist to paint a beautiful painting on the side of that flow hive. For any of you artists, <laughs> I just think it'd be so beautiful. But I don't, know, I don't know what kind of paint to use if you're using outdoor um, paint to paint a beautiful picture on that flow hive. But I thought that'd be so fun. All right, guys. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for dropping in to my live stream tonight. I have had a long day. Looking forward to getting off work here in a few minutes and uh, resting the rest of the evening. I want to thank you all for commenting and being a part of um, the, um, the chat tonight. And I'm going to be here every Thursday night as long as I can do this and don't have other obligations, but going to be here for you guys. It's a way to support you. So again, let me just recap what I want you to do. Please ask your questions here on Thursday night more than on my um, YouTube channel because I can't get to all the comments on my YouTube channel. And also, um, please watch the video. I just made a new video. So after this one, go on my channel, find this one, Finding the Queen in a Hot Hive. Uh, you'll be so glad that you watched this video. It'll be so helpful for you. So, oh, looks like somebody came in kind of late. Always Central Time, always 7 o'clock Central Time. So, uh, hey, thank you. I uh, appreciate that, uh, that you enjoy the content. Really do. B Team 6 member. All right. So, guys, we're going to sign off. See you next time. Have a good night. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching.